Good morning and welcome to worship at First United Methodist Church of Ferndale. The 16th Sunday after Pentecost on September 20th in the year 2020. Glad you've joined us this morning for online worship. A couple of words of preparation before we begin our service. And certainly I want to remind you that uh, today is the Ferndale area crop walk. Um, most of us will be walking virtually. Some of us will be walking separately uh, due to the pandemic. And uh, you can still go online and pledge support, give support, uh, register. You can register to walk or support any of us. I'd welcome uh, more support for me. I'll be walking some this afternoon. Uh, just go to uh, www.crophungerwalk all one word, crophungerwalk.org, and slash Ferndale MI, Ferndale MI, all one word. And you can pledge to support any of our walkers, and you'll find our names there uh, on the website. Crophungerwalk.org slash Ferndale MI. Thank you for your support. Interfaith Power and Light has a, a series of webinars coming up. It's called the Green Team Summit. And um, you can read about that if you download the program for today's service. And uh, we'll put m more information about that too in my Monday message email that goes out to any of you that want to receive a weekly email from me. So uh, feel free to sign up for that email, send us a message, and we'll put you on our Monday message list. We want to congratulate uh, Joe Lemelin of Wayne State University and John Lemelin at the University of Michigan who were awarded our uh, fall scholarships this year. Um, we'll be offering more scholarships come January, so uh, feel free to if you know someone who's attending some kind of uh, higher education, you can uh, get the applications from our office and uh, possibly, very possibly receive a scholarship for, from us for January. This week's Bible study, we move into 1 Samuel after a very stimulating study of the book of Ruth. Uh, 1 Samuel chapter 3. It's a familiar story. And I think we'll enjoy new insights into that story. First Samuel chapter 3, and we've added actually chapter 4 as well. So chapters 3 and 4, if you want to follow along with our Zoom Bible study, you can join us in that. These are, of course, very weighty days in the life of our world in the life of our country and in the life of our church. And we're looking forward to a time when we can be gathered together again, uh, see each other's face, faces and enjoy this time uh, together in our sanctuary. But until then, uh, we're worshiping online and we welcome you and uh, turn our attention now to God and God's deliverance, God's liberation as God uh, liberates the children of Israel in our lives as well. Let's begin by singing the hymn, Lead On, O Cloud of Presence.
Let's pray together. Liberating God, freedom must have seemed an unlikely dream to those hesitant Hebrews so long ago. They needed someone to believe for them because they struggled to believe for themselves. You sent Moses, full of doubts yet full of passion, and he led them under your hand through dangers, toils, and snares. Your will is freedom and fullness of life for all people, for all of creation. Whether your leaders were named Moses or Jesus or Mary or Martin or Susan or Rosa or Nelson or Desmond or Ruth or names not recalled, you have called people to inspire us and to lead us forward, to lead where we have trouble believing, liberate us from small dreams, and grant us visions of what can be. Amen. Good morning, kids. Uh, yesterday, Jill and I took Reese to the river walk along the shore of the Detroit River, and then we went over to Belle Isle. Haven't been to Belle Isle since last winter when we had a picnic there on the beach by ourselves. But uh, it was good to get back and we did some things on Belle Isle that were fun. We took proper precautions everywhere we were. And one of the things we did was went to one of the playgrounds where they have something that's kind of like a, uh, a zip line. It's not a zip line, but it's like a chair that goes back and forth on a runner. And it slides and you go, woo, yeah, it's a lot of fun. Anyway, we went on that and, uh, well, actually we didn't go on that because uh, Reese was just a little bit scared. And when he says, I'm just a little bit scared, uh, we listened to him, and uh, being just a little bit scared is fine. You know, we all get just a little bit scared sometimes. And uh, even though uh, when he was littler, we'd put him on that chair, and we had run him back and forth on that line, he didn't remember. He had forgotten that he was on it before and that he liked it. So being just a little bit scared, he didn't do it this time. But if we had stayed longer, we had to leave. If, he'd, if we had stayed longer, he would have done it and had a good time doing it again because it's a fun thing to do. Uh, sometimes things make us a little bit scared. And the story today from our Bibles is about uh, a whole bunch of people, a whole group of people that uh, escaped from slavery. And they went and got away and they crossed the sea and crossed over and then they're in a wilderness but they were, they were a little bit scared every step of the way they were a little bit scared 
Sometimes we get scared about things. Maybe it's a, a test that's coming up at school or maybe it's, we won't be able to do something right that we want to try or uh, we're a little bit scared to try something new sometimes. Uh, being a little bit scared is part of being human. We all get a little bit scared about some things. And so that shouldn't stop us from trying. In fact, the people in the story today, uh, the, they were called the Israelites, or we call them the Hebrew people. Uh, they got all the way up to the water and uh, they were scared because they couldn't, they were being chased and they were at the water and they didn't know what was going to happen. Well, in this story, God used a mysterious wind to blow the water apart and they walked through the water and got away. Uh, that's a strange story, one of the most fun stories in the Bible, how God helped the people to escape um, and helped to set them free. But when we're scared and we don't know if we're gonna make it or not, if we're gonna do the right thing or not, or if we're going to uh, be successful and do, the, uh, do good at what we wanna do or uh, pass a test or whatever it might be, uh, God can help us. God can make a way for us and help us, first of all, not to be scared. And sometimes God will even change things for us to make it better for us too. And if things don't change and we're still scared, we know that God will walk with us through whatever we're going through and God will help us. So being a little bit scared is okay. We can admit it and then we go on and know God is with us. Let's pray. Dear Lord, thank you for being with us and for helping us to be not so scared when things are scary in life, because sometimes they are. Sometimes we don't know what's going to happen next, and sometimes we don't know if we're going to uh, do the right thing or not, and sometimes we don't know if we're going to um, be safe even sometimes but you're with us and you will help us and we just thank you that you help us through scary times as well in Jesus name we ask it and thank you amen Our gospel lesson comes to us from Matthew chapter 20, verses 1 through 16. The story, it's a tale that Jesus told. We call them parables. The kingdom of heaven is like a landowner who went out early in the morning to hire laborers for his vineyard. After agreeing with the laborers for the usual daily wage, he sent them into his vineyard and when he went out about nine o'clock, he saw them standing idle in the marketplace, and he said to them, you also go into the vineyard, and I will pay you whatever is right. So they went. And when he went out again about noon and about three o'clock, he did the same. And about five o'clock, he went out and found others standing around. And he said to them, why are you standing here idle all day? And they said to him, because no one has hired us. He said to them, you also go into the vineyard. And when evening came, the owner of the vineyard said to his manager, call the laborers and give them their pay, beginning with the last and then going to the first. When those hired about five o'clock came, each of them received the usual daily wage. Now, when the first came, they thought they would receive more, but each of them also received the usual daily wage. And when they received it, they grumbled against the landowner, saying, These last worked only one hour, and you've made them equal to us, who have borne the burden of the day and the scorching heat. But he replied to one of them, Friend, I am doing you no wrong. Did you not agree with me for the usual daily wage? Take what belongs to you and go. I choose to give to this last the same as I give to you. 
Am I not allowed to do what I choose with what belongs to me? Or are you envious because I am generous? So the last will be first, and the first will be last. The Gospel of our Lord. Thanks be to God. I want to talk about that passage. Actually, I'm going to read something from that passage about uh, that someone has written. To just kind of summarize it, about three years ago I preached on this passage about the landowner and the workers in the vineyard, so I'm not going to preach about it this week. But I want to uh, share these words that kind of summarize sometimes the way we feel. He says, it's striking to consider just how much of our everyday lives at home, at school, at work, and even in personal relationships are saturated with this basic idea, you get, what you, you get out what you put in. But the householder's response makes clear that this vineyard, and by extension the kingdom of heaven, operates according to a very different, apparently upside-down logic. Divine blessings are given not according to who works the hardest, but rather according to the sovereign, generous will of the householder. Such blessings then are not rewards at all, but gifts. The governing ethos of the kingdom of heaven is not work and reward, but rather gift and gratitude. When we see each other as fellow beneficiaries of God's merciful gifts, equally unentitled and equally beloved, the whole idea of us and them begins to fall away. The remark, you have made them equal to us, becomes a celebration, not a complaint. You've made them equal to us. And what emerges is an ever-widening we, neighbors worthy of love, children of the God who is love, the one who turns the world right side up, humbling the first and lifting up the last. It's a good thought. Now let's turn our attention to the liberation of the Hebrews, and the song, Go Down, Moses.
for our attention this morning. I've lifted out um, several verses from the book of Exodus, chapters 14 and 16. Chapter 15 in between is a song, and it's well worth reading, but I'm not going to read it this morning. But here are some select verses from chapters 14 and 16 uh, of the book of Exodus. And Moses stretched out his hand over the sea. We know the circumstances there. there. They're at the Sea of Reeds, or the, sometimes the Red Sea. The Lord drove the sea back by a strong wind all night and turned the sea into dry land, and the waters were divided. And the Israelites went into the sea on dry ground, and the waters formed a wall for them on their right and on their left. And the, the Egyptians pursued and went into the sea after them, all of Pharaoh's horses, chariots, and chariot drivers. And at the morning watch, the Lord in the pillar of fire and cloud looked down upon the Egyptian army and threw the Egyptian army into panic. He clogged their chariot wheels so that they turned with difficulty. And the Egyptians said, Let us flee from the Israelites, for the Lord is fighting for them against Egypt. And then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the sea so that the water may come back upon the Egyptians, upon their chariots and chariot drivers. So Moses stretched out his hand over the sea, and at dawn the sea returned to its normal depth. As the Egyptians fled before it, the Lord tossed the Egyptians into the sea, and the waters returned and covered the chariots and the chariot drivers. The entire army of Pharaoh that had followed them into the sea, not one of them remained. And now, Shortly thereafter, in chapter 16, on the other side of the sea, heading out into the wilderness, this ragtag group is now without food. Chapter 16, beginning at 2. The whole congregation of the Israelites complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt when we sat by the flesh pots and ate our fill of bread. For you've brought us out into this wilderness to kill this whole assembly with hunger. Then the Lord said to Moses, I am going to rain bread from heaven for you, and each day the people shall go out and gather enough for that day. And in that way I will test them whether they will follow my instruction or not. On the sixth day, when they prepare what they bring in, it will be twice as much as they gather on other days. So Moses and Aaron said to all of the Israelites, In the evening you shall know that it was the Lord who brought you out of the land of Egypt, and in the morning you shall see the glory of the Lord, because God has heard your complaining against the Lord. For what are we that you complain against us? And Moses said, When the Lord gives you meat to eat in the evening and your fill of bread in the morning, because the Lord has heard the complaining that you utter against God, what are we? Your complaining is not against us, but against the Lord. And then Moses said to Aaron, Say to the whole congregation, of the Israelites, draw near to the Lord, for God has heard your complaining. And as Aaron spoke to the whole congregation of the Israelites, they looked toward the wilderness, and the glory of the Lord appeared in a cloud. And the Lord spoke to Moses and said, I have heard the complaining of the Israelites. Say to them, At twilight you shall eat meat, and in the morning you shall have your fill of bread. And then you shall know that I am the Lord your God. And in the evening, quails came up and covered the camp. And in the morning, there was a layer of dew around the camp. And when the layer of dew lifted, there on the surface of the wilderness was a fine flaky substance as, as fine as frost on the ground. 
And when the Israelites saw it, they said to one another, What is it? For they did not know what it was. And Moses said to them, It is the bread that the Lord has given you to eat. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Egypt was probably the greatest of the world powers at that, that time. They were led by a ruler, the pharaoh, who was paranoid, who had surrounded himself with all kinds of yes-men. And <clears throat> he capitalized on the people's fears of the Hebrews, the Hebrews who were a ragtag bunch of uh, refugees who had been living in the land for now almost 400 years, and uh, they, they lived in a sort of ghetto in the northeast corner of the country. But uh, Pharaoh made sure that people bought into those fears by saying if those people in that area of Goshen ever uh, united, ever got together, they could cause all kinds of trouble for the nation. And then along comes a dusty man out of Egypt's past, a guy by the name of Rose, Moses, and he's uh, rumored to have been brought up in the house of nobility, but he's come back now. He's come back, and along with him comes trouble, and there's all kinds of unrest now percolating in the country, and there are fears that if Moses gets any more power or if uh, Moses gets the people united, their power is going to create uh, trouble for the Egyptians. And if Moses gets his way and does the kinds of things that it is uh, purported that he might be able to do, he will become a terrorist in the country and provoke a showdown. That's the way he's looked upon by the Egyptians, by Pharaoh, of course, he's a terrorist that's come back to wreak havoc with the unity, the supposed unity of the nation. Moses, of course, on the other hand, isn't ready for this. He doesn't even necessarily want to be here, but he feels compelled because God has called him. And he's got a few, shall we say, magic tricks up his sleeve, things that he can do with his staff and with his cloak and all of that. And he is supposed to go to the Pharaoh, who is the ruler of the mightiest nation in the world, and uh, tell Pharaoh, please let thousands, several thousands of my people go. Go out into the wilderness where they want to worship their God. And they, they want their freedom, maybe, these Hebrew people. God wants them to have it, certainly. Uh, the only problem is that Moses isn't even sure that the people even want to be freed. Sure, they're sick of being uh, put to hard labor. They're sick of uh, laboring on the projects, the work projects of the Egyptians. They're sick of not having enough, and just barely getting by, scraping along. Not only that, but for Moses... He's already been told by God that Pharaoh is going to just say no. Every step of the way, Pharaoh is going to say no. But Moses goes anyway. He picks up his brother Aaron along the way. His brother Aaron's a, a good talker, smooth, very well-spoken, eloquent. And somewhere along the way, they also pick up his sister Miriam, who's something of a poet and uh, uh, a woman who believes in liberation herself. First of all, Moses calls a conference of the leaders of the Hebrew people. He calls them, tells them, here's the plan. We're going to appeal to Pharaoh, and I'm going to give God's message to Pharaoh, and then all of us are going to go out three days' journey into the wilderness. And the leaders of the Hebrew people kind of scratch their head and say, well, all right, if you're sure God's behind it, I guess we can give it a try. So Moses goes, and he makes that appeal to Pharaoh. And what does Pharaoh do? He simply makes the tasks of the Hebrews harder. So now Moses' plan has backfired. 
even as God had predicted that it would. And the people blame Moses for this, for their sore backs, for their sore hands, and they're sore at God, too. Um, maybe Moses is a little bit sore at God. Why, God? Why are you putting us through all of this? And God says, I'm still going to do what I said I would do. And he sends Moses back to the leaders, but now the leaders of the Hebrew people don't believe him anymore. Uh, just leave us alone, Moses. Leave us alone. Things were not good, but they were predictable. We knew where we stood. We don't need your kind of help, which is only going to make our lives harder. But Moses, <clears throat> ignoring the leaders of Israel, or the, of the Hebrew people, uh, their complaints, has a bigger vision. He sees something more that can be. And he goes back. He goes anyway, in spite of all of this. And the people think he's crazy and Aaron then pulls off a few tricks with his rod, but the Pharaoh's magicians pull off the same kind of tricks, almost pretty much the same stuff, uh, the things that they do, and big deal, huh? Nothing happens. But then, then come what we call, have come to know as the plagues. Moses takes his staff and he strikes the river Nile and According to the story, the Nile turns to blood and every living thing in the Nile dies. He has struck at the lifeblood of Egypt because the lifeblood of Egypt is the river Nile. It is the mother goddess of the land. But Pharaoh says no. Again and again, Moses returns uh, bringing with him the plagues of God there's the plague of frogs, then gnats and flies, and then the livestock get sick and die, except for not in the Hebrew ghetto. Boils, oh, thunder and hail. By now, even the Egyptians are scared by all of this stuff, and, and when they hear about the next plague on the way, they hurry all their livestock inside. Everything is safe in Goshen. Locusts, every plant and tree shaved bare. Along the way, Pharaoh says, go, and then he changes his mind. No, go becomes no. And then comes the ninth plague. Darkness covers the whole land of Egypt for three full days. Nothing happens. Everything grinds to a halt. No sun, no telling time. All life has stopped. Nine plagues, nine no's. But the people begin to wonder. Even old Pharaoh begins to wonder because the first plague, God strikes against the mother goddess of Egypt. The ninth plague, God strikes against the father god of Egypt, the sun god, Ra, is darkened, greatest god of all Egypt. And in between frogs and locusts and thunder and hail, these are some of the lesser gods of Egypt all shut down. And their people of Egypt are wondering if even their own gods have turned against them. And by now, the tide has turned and Moses has become respected and feared throughout all of Egypt. And so God has Moses ask the people to borrow gold and silver from their Egyptian uh, neighbors, any Egyptians that live near them. And finally, he goes to Pharaoh one last time. And he tells Pharaoh, if you will not, if you continue to say no, there is one last plague coming, and it is going to be taking the firstborn of all of your nation, of all of your people, all the livestock, all the people, from the greatest to the lowest. Everything will be struck. And it says, in hot anger, 
Moses left Pharaoh. We're not sure what that anger is about, whether it's anger at Pharaoh's obstinance or anger at the kind of catastrophe that is coming. How would you feel if you had announced again and again what you believe God wanted for the people and not a thing was ever done about it? And there's not a thing you can do to make things go right. There is all of this stubbornness and it's going to lead to death and destruction. Meanwhile, the Hebrews have made arrangements. Each household has a lamb going to be eaten. And if you're too, too poor or too small to, to have a lamb, you can share one with your neighbors. But make sure that nothing is left on this particular night. There's a prescribed ritual for cooking and for eating the lamb. And there's a prescribed ritual for what to do with the blood and smear it on the doorway. Uh, and you're supposed to eat this lamb right around midnight and be dressed, be dressed at midnight, ready to go, your sandals on your feet, your bags packed, and the hours crawl by that night and the dark is over the land and the smell of roasting lamb is in the air all over Goshen. And the Egyptians that live nearby try to act as if it's any other day, but they're nervous, they're fidgety. Something's going on out there that night. And they can't sleep. They're finding it even hard to breathe that night. What's coming out? What's, what's coming out there in the night? And at midnight, as they eat of, in their safe, comfortable homes, uh, uh, in their, as they have eaten earlier, the Egyptians have eaten earlier in their safe, comfortable homes all over the land of Egypt. At midnight, the firstborn begin to die. Firstborn from Pharaoh's household all the way to the prisoner in the dungeon, the firstborn children die. And in the midst of the night, middle of the night, Pharaoh calls Moses and Aaron, and Pharaoh now says, go, get out of here. Go, worship your God in the wilderness. Get, take your flocks, take your herds, get out of my sight. Go, get the hell out of here. And they do. The whole kit and caboodle of them, this bizarre passel of losers and hangers-on and slaves takes off. Thousands and thousands of them were told. And the presence of God goes before them as a cloud by day and a fire by night. And Pharaoh then again changes his mind. He sends out the troops after them. And then these Hebrews, who will later be called Israelites, hit the wall. Or they hit the sea, rather. We don't know where it was exactly. The Sea of Reeds. We only know that uh, they can't move. They're up against it, and the armies of Pharaoh are closing in. But the presence of God moves between Pharaoh's army and the people of the Hebrews. And God uh, tells Moses, stretch out your hand. And Moses stretches out his hand, and the, an east wind blows through the waters through the walls of water, and the walls of water open on either side. We know about wa wa water. We know about wind and water. At the very beginning of the Bible, the Spirit of God moves upon the face of the deep, blows across the face of the deep, and a wind blows across the waters. This is creation language. Creation language uh, all over again. This is creation language. Something new is being created here at the Red Sea. Uh, a new beginning here on the edge of the sea. This is creation winning out over chaos all over again, just as it did in the very beginning. We know the rest of the story, how when Moses raises his hand again in the morning, the waters close in. And those, we, we hear this story and we think to ourselves, oh, but the Egyptians, 
What a horrible story we say and we, as we view this story with our 21st century eyes. And it is indeed a horrifying story. All that death and destruction. Uh, we don't want to believe it. We, we find it hard to believe that God would do anything like this. But then we have to ask another question that may be a deeper question. How much of this is really God's doing? Oh, well, God gets the credit or the blame as always, but how much of this happening is simply the natural consequences? How much of this is just one arrogant, powerful man who refuses to listen to his people and even to his best advisors, one man who leads his own people to their graves. He's a man who has set up his nation in such a way that the inevitable results of an economy that is built on forced labor and exploitation and domination is going to come down. And the firstborn are dead. The firstborn are dead and there's no hint that Pharaoh even cares. Nothing about tears for his own son. Nothing about remorse for what his ego has cost his people. Nothing about regret for his policies that end up in bodies of soldiers and horses washed up on the shores, caught in his twisted need to be right. God gets the credit or the blame, of course, because that was the majority of the way that Hebrews thought, everybody thought in those days, depending on where you stand. But it's not hard to see what led to this. In fact, the rabbis, the old ancient rabbis tell a story that when this happened, it's, they say there were tears in God's eyes. And another rabbi story says that the angels were singing in celebration at the deliverance of Israel and God instead says to them, stop, my handiwork are drowning in the sea and you are singing? We don't know all of the facts. We know what people have said about God. We know what the writers believed about God in their day. This is a story written down long after the events that it tells. So what can we say instead? What can we say in the midst of such ugliness and destruction? We can say that sometimes values clash in this world. We can say that people with power virtually always want to keep it. We can also say that God wills freedom and fullness for everyone. Martin Luther, the monk in the time of the Reformation, believed that God willed freedom, freedom from the oppressive powers We forget sometimes that in the cause of freedom, uh, supposed freedom with a lot of selfishness throw, thrown in, I suppose, that uh, the leaders of our own country in the early days, Washington, Jefferson, Franklin, yes, and of course, Hamilton, these were deeply flawed people and many of them were slaveholders. Yet they caught a glimpse of a better world uh, that could be, but those who served under them, those who uh, commanded uh, the, the forces under them, uh, were considered terrorists. And the methods that they used by the British considered terrorists. Their tactics were the tactics of terrorists. And there was all kinds of destruction of property during that time. It was a movement for freedom. The movements for freedom do not always happen uh, in exactly the way we would like them for to happen. Call it liberation. It was. It happened in 
Central and South America. Uh, sometimes it happens through the influence of the churches when people rise up and say we will not tolerate this kind of treatment anymore. It happened around, uh, the, around Gandhi. We remember Gandhi leading his people in the march to the sea. We remember Gandhi uh, thinking that peace could come and liberation for his people could come through without violence. And his own people did not participate in violence, but there was violence around him. We remember Frederick Douglass and Sojourner Truth, these people who spoke out and who finally were able, like Aaron, to make people believe, like Moses, to make people believe there is a reason why the book of Exodus and the story of liberation in Exodus became also a tale that was crucial for those who sought freedom from slavery. There were people along the way like, like Susan B. Anthony, Elizabeth Cady Stanton, who suffered violence and their followers suffered violence so that half of the American population, the female half, could be able to vote and have a say. It was a revolution of sorts and the freedom to vote and then when it finally came, sadly, it did not come for black women. And then, in days that some of us remember, Martin Luther King Jr. led the civil rights movement that was to bring freedom and equality and equity to all people in our nation. When there is liberation and when there is need for liberation and when there is desire for liberation, when Jesus in his first message said, I came to set at liberty those who are oppressed, it is God who plants the desire for freedom in the human spirit. If it is true liberty and true liberation, it is God who plants the desire. Not just a selfish wrenching of power, that happens all too often in other places in our world, but that's not what this is about. This is about true liberation from God. Sometimes all those noble dreams of liberation, of freedom and fullness, dry up and blow away or burn up around us when there's nothing to eat or when uh, the job is gone or maybe the home is gone too. The Israelites are safely past the sea but that doesn't mean they never glance back. And now there's no food, and they're out there in the middle of nowhere, and so they complain. It's not the first time, and it won't be the last time either. How soon we forget. How soon we forget. But God says, I hear. We forget, but God hears. God will liberate. God will also provide. Ours is to remember and trust. Once we're on the road to freedom and justice and deliverance, don't turn back. We may not understand all of the wreckage we left behind us. We may not understand what God is providing for us right now in this moment. The Hebrews got all of this stuff on the ground in the morning. But all they could say was, what's it? That's what they called it, mana, manna, which means what's it? And we might need our own Moses to lead us through or to help us to believe or someone to, to believe in us to believe in us sometimes when we can't even believe in ourselves. What about us today? Have we hit the wall? Have we come up against some kind of decision, some place in our lives? And we wonder, here we are, will God get us through this? Will God get us through this crisis? Will God get us through 
what's happening all around us in the world. It even happens on a personal level when a uh, a woman shows up at a safe house and she is uh, weighing in at 92 pounds when at one time she was overweight, but she has been beaten so much and some man has exercised so much power over her that uh, she has come to believe that he would never grant her a divorce. He would never get her, leave her alone. She would never get her own children. But then somehow, slowly, some little unknown Moses helps her to believe that life can be different. She can be liberated. She can get through her sea that stands in her way. Got any rivers you think are uncrossable? Got any mountains you can't tunnel through? God specializes in things thought impossible. God does those things others can't do, but God also does those things that others won't do. Maybe we're facing choices, decisions, some kind that are going to, some kinds of decisions that are going to affect the very future of our lives. There are some stands we need to take, some rivers we need to cross, and we need to step forward into the unknown, step forward into the water. Because sometimes we just have to think with our feet. <laughs> when you stop and think about it, those Hebrew people took a very small act, just stepping forward, stepping forward into the water, willing to get their feet wet to take a chance. One day when they were scared witless and, and somehow, somehow that stepping forward into the water fit into the much larger cosmic drama of evil defeated. Martin Luther King Jr. once said, imperialistic nations trampling over other nations in the iron, <clears throat> with the iron feet of oppression. That was a phrase from one of, one of the messages but friends, whether it's war horses and chariots or feet marching across the Edmund Pettus Bridge or Gandhi's march to the sea, iron feet are going to sink, but faithful feet will trudge on when the cause is just. And so we walk on. We use our feet. We think with our feet. And sometimes that's more important than stopping to parse it all out and figure it all out. Just think with our feet. But then again, maybe God has just called us to swim. Yes, to swim, to struggle for a while. God will make a way because God wants us free, all of us, but that may not be the same for any of us. And it may come to us, each of us, in some different way. It's not going to come to us all in the same way. What does matter is that we don't turn back. God is here. God is here to guide our steps. And there will be questions on our way to liberation and fullness for all. So let's ask those questions. What must be dismantled so God's people may all be truly free? When God leads us through, what will the new land we walk on look like? What is our place in the new creation that God intends for this world? Will it be farther back than what we've been used to? As Jesus said, the first will be last. When we see 
the ruin and the devastation around us, how will we react? Whose bodies may be left along the shore? Violent bodies. Innocent bodies. They are the cost of human selfishness and arrogance. What will ever become of the weapons of tyranny, whether they are horses and chariots or guns and drones? And maybe the most telling question of all in the wilderness is, what is enough? As we journey through the wilderness with all of our hungers and thirsts, our complaints and our victories that come from God, what is enough? What do we mean by enough? Jesus tells the story about workers hired at different times of the day, and he hints that his people, if they know anything about God at all, know that God doesn't provide based on merit, but based on need, and also based on God's sheer goodness. God says, I'm generous because I choose to be generous. I liberate because I choose to liberate. I want my people free because I made them and I choose them day after day after day. Back in the days when South Africa was still under apartheid system, a political rally was planned, a rally to, to rally to for liberation, for equality. The government canceled the rally. And so instead of the rally, uh, Bishop Desmond Tutu scheduled a worship service in St. George's Cathedral where he was resident. And so there in that worship service in St. George's Cathedral, the walls were lined with soldiers and riot police. They carried guns. They carried bayonets. They were ready to close it down if anything got out of hand in that packed cathedral of people wanting and yearning to be free. And Bishop Tutu bravely went to the pulpit and began to talk about, to speak of the evils of the apartheid system the evils of a system that keeps in place inequality. He began to talk about how the rulers and authorities that propped it up, that whole system, were doomed to fail. They were doomed to fall. It could not last in God's good timing. And Bishop Tutu from that pulpit pointed a finger at the police standing along the sides. And people who were there recorded his words. Bishop Tutu said to them, You may be powerful. You may be very powerful. But you are not God. God cannot be mocked. You have already lost. And then, as the tension in that room was unbearable, would they close in? Would they arrest him? Whatever the tension was, Bishop Tutu seemed to soften. A smile came across his face, and many of us who have seen him uh, on TV or wherever know about that beautiful smile of his. And he came out from behind the pulpit, and with that radiant smile in his own special way, Bishop Tutu began to bounce up and down with glee. And he said, therefore, since you have already lost, we are inviting you to join the winning side. And the crowd roared. The crowd roared. The police, well, mostly they just melted away. 
But when they were gone, the people began to dance in the aisles. Amen. And amen. Let's pray. Living God, it is not so very difficult for us to know what your will is in this world. For you have created us all. You know us each by name. You have made us to be caretakers and cooperators with the rest of creation. And as we bow before you right now, we admit that we've made a mess. But nonetheless, we've had our Moseses, we've had our Martins, We've had those like our newly departed Ruth Bader Ginsburg, who have stood for all people, who have stood for liberation and the rights of all, And we feel an overwhelming sense of loss today, oh God. Loving God. Creating God. Liberating God. We so much want your will to be done on earth as it is in heaven. God help your people. God help your planet. God of the universe, hear our prayers. Deliver us. Grant us a new creation, new hope, new possibilities new joys, and make us strong to be your people in this world. For Jesus' sake and in his name we pray together. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Let's lift our voices to sing.
We receive now the blessing. May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ whose mission was to deliver the oppressed and the all-embracing love of God who loves us all alike and the power and presence of God's Spirit lead us forth and guide our feet now and always. So be it. Amen.